Yeah. I think the crowd's still growing, but in line with my vow to always start actually, um, I will begin. Um, it's wonderful to, to see you all here today. Thank you so much for coming. When I first met Anne Cleveland, the executive director of the Library Society, who was at her son's wedding today, so we'll forgive her for not being here. Um, she said that she had not entered this building until she was hired to do the job as executive director. She'd never crossed, she'd never set foot in the building. And so when we were talking about the concept for Wide Angle, we said, well, it would be really great if we could um, achieve every week that people come in who have not been before. So I'm looking around, I'm thinking like, there are certainly a couple of people who haven't been to a Wide Angle talk yet, and so I'm pleased to say mission accomplished for this week. Um, Please all do come again. There are lots of exciting talks coming up. Ron Atkinson is going to speak next week about the Sudan and what's happening there. We're all aware of Darfur, although it's gone out of the headlines recently, but actually there's a big, big shift happening there as the country splits to create the world's newest nation of southern Sudan. So, and Ron Atkinson is a world-renowned expert who I first heard about actually through my history professor at Oxford. He said, oh, you've got someone in South Carolina who really knows about that part of the world. So it would be great to see you lots of you there as well next week. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to thank um, our sponsors of today's lunch, Eva Rotorium. They are an automotive drive shelf manufacturer from Ladson up the road, and they do a lot of work in the community in North Charleston and in Ladson. And so we're really delighted that they've actually chosen to support something downtown. And um, thank you very much for sponsoring our lunch. to many of you from his um, columns in Charleston C magazine and from 25 years of writing and editing at the Post and Courier. I know that anything Jack tells me to go to or, or buy through the pages of his column, I, I duly obey. <laughs> and so far, it's always turned out to be a very good idea. Um, Jack is Charleston born and bred. He was educated all over the US, uh, in Michigan, in North Carolina. And so I'm personally delighted that he decided to come back here and spend the last 30 years uh, researching the, particularly the musical history of Charleston and its place in, in American history. He's uh, involved in a lot of public community works, counselling, public affairs administration, but we all know him perhaps best for his work around music. Without people like Jack and the people who he inspires and the people who work with him, we wouldn't have the Moja Arts Festival, we wouldn't have Jazz Artists of Charleston, a, a presenting organization which puts on a lot of fantastic concerts throughout the year. Um, we wouldn't have the Charleston Jazz Orchestra, um, which is again another really top quality orchestra that many of you will know even better than I do. Um, so as I said, Jack's been researching jazz here for, for the last 30 years really, but in 2003 he formalized this by forming the Charleston Jazz Initiative as a um, coming together of academics and historians and people involved in, in musical history. And in 2007, he published Charleston Jazz, which the Library Society has a copy of, which is out there. Um, if you don't have a copy yourselves, I'm sure we will find a way to tell you how to find it. Amazon.com. Amazon.com, <laughs> of course. And um, Jack also edited Whiskey and Jazz, a book by Hans Ofringer, um, which is a uh, wonderful can I say coffee table book? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. it's a beautiful, a, a beautiful book, which um, you will also find on Amazon and probably Borders and some other places as well. Anyway, I think you can probably tell no one is better placed to tell us about Charleston's unique place in the history of American music than Jack and join me in welcoming him. Well, good afternoon. Everybody can hear me okay? Good, good. I'm actually glad this is up here. I have to um, project as I might have to have if um, I didn't have the microphone. Um, I've been uh, quite busy lately, and the pollen has descended upon my vocal cords. And um, it's been a bit of uh, tough going lately, but um, as my mother used to say, I'll press on. Uh, it's really good to be here this afternoon. Um, I almost feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, I recognize quite a few people uh, out in the house. Uh, Pat here, who I don't think misses anything in the Low Country that has anything remotely connected to do 
uh, with Jazz, Peter and Suzanne, Leanne, uh, John Paul, people are everywhere. So, um, Tom, that makes me feel a little more comfortable, a little more secure about uh, sitting up here in front of you. Uh, and this is a light. Uh, I actually relish every opportunity to share <clears throat> what I know about this story of uh, Charleston Jazz. It's actually little known uh, even here in the Charleston area, but in my opinion and that of many others, quite important in that it's, uh, for my money, a cornerstone of American culture, especially with regard to music. For a ton of reasons, uh, so many so that I probably don't need to go into in this little bit of time we had this afternoon. Uh, it just hasn't been told. Uh, one of my friends and colleagues, a gentleman by the name of Dan Morgenstern, who is the dean of jazz historians and jazz researchers and writers, he runs the Jazz Institute up at Rutgers University largest jazz archive in the world. Uh, he contends that it's sheer laziness on the part of his historians as to why uh, the Charleston story with regard to one of the country's greatest contributions to world culture has not been told. Uh, they seem to have relied on only sharing what happened in New Orleans and what has come out of there over the course of the history of this music and it is an interesting story, and it is relevant, and it is true, but uh, any more, as we delve more and more into what really happened in a number of places in the country, particularly the Southeast, uh, we've come to call the New Orleans story a creation myth. That's not to denigrate it or degrade it, but it's exactly what it is. It's a bit oversimplified to think that something as historic and profound as the invention of jazz music started with one guy on one dock in one town that inspired two or three other people who went up the Mississippi River to Chicago and then a couple of years later went over to New York City and then changed the whole world. Uh, not so. Uh, again, it's true and it's not to take away from them but uh, that happened in lots of places. And people like myself who look into this uh, area of study call these places cradles of jazz. And that's what we think Charleston, South Carolina is. Coastal South Carolina, actually. Not really restricted to the town or city of Charleston. And quite frankly, the whole state of South Carolina over the course of the 20th century, which is uh, uh, the time span for the evolution of jazz music. People from all around the state uh, participated in the growth and development of this music, but the epicenter, like for a lot of other things, was right here in coastal South Carolina, and in the middle of that was uh, Charleston. The primary contributing factor to the invention, and that's exactly what it is, of jazz music has to do with the coming together of European culture and African culture, West African in particular. Uh, jazz is not an African art form. Uh, there are attributes of it that would allow you to think that. Some people even propose that. It's not true. It's not a European art form. And there are characteristics of it that could have you believing that, but it's not true. Uh, in fact, it needs to be looked at in terms of being a benchmark along the way of African-American culture, uh, particularly as evolved here in the United States, North America. The roots of the music actually begin with the, what W.E.B. Du Bois called the sorrow songs, the spirituals. And they are deeply embedded here in coastal South Carolina. And it's where they were first heard by people other than the people who created it, where they were first recorded, and where they were shared around the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Uh, a particular example 
is a Union Civil War colonel by the name of Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who led uh, a group of so-called colored troops during the Civil War down around Beaufort and Hilton Head. And he heard those spirituals being sung by those soldiers, and it changed his life. He decided to put down in musical notation what he heard and had it published uh, when he went back north. He was from Massachusetts and uh, began to expose the rest of the world to what was going on uh, down here. Uh, the spirituals uh, led into the work songs and the field hollers and the chants. Uh, all the stuff that the enslaved Africans and later freed Africans practiced in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, toward the end of the 19th century, after freedom, uh, we had the development of popular music, uh, mostly expressed through minstrelsy, and the blues came along, then ragtime, and then jazz. So, in order to appreciate the beginnings of jazz, you need to contextualize it in terms of that uh, process of this music introduced by people of color in this country. Uh, I use the word invented because jazz was in fact invented by African Americans, but obviously it's not exclusive to African Americans. It wasn't at the very beginning, it never has been, uh, blacks have been its major innovators, but there are lots of exceptions along the way, including some people from Charleston. I'll mention one in particular uh, a little later. But uh, as the contradictions of uh, a group of people being enslaved uh, are, uh, all of this beauty, all of this truth as embodied in jazz music came out of these contradictions. Uh, but it's an exchange, it's a kind of hybrid, a kind of melding. Uh, in terms of uh, philosophy, uh, the word syncretism comes to mind. S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M, which is a process that has disparate elements coming together to form something new that transcends either of the two or three that uh, formed it and to create something new. Jazz is a perfect example of that. Uh, Charleston was certainly a place in its history where African culture and European culture uh, came together, uh, collided, if you will, and all sorts of exchanges uh, took place. Uh, the brutality of slavery aside, all of the negative aspects of that mode of production uh, standing aside. In spite or in light of all of that, an amazing amount of negotiation took place. It's the way people live. A lot of it was economic driven. People were striving for a way to make a living on both sides of the divide. And there were all sorts of breaches, if you will, of law, policy, and custom that allowed people to survive and sometimes even thrive. Uh, most of you probably know the story of Denmark Vesey, who led the slave rebellion here in the early 1800s. And he positioned himself to do that by buying his freedom. Well, how does a slave buy his freedom? Seems to fly in the face of being a slave. What that tells me is that some negotiation, we know from historical research that this in fact happened. There was some negotiation around what the laws, policies, and customs were, and people were able to work out a way to get certain things done that were advantageous to all the policies uh, involved. I guess the lawyers would call it consideration. Um, everybody gets something out of the contract. That's what makes it a contract. And a lot of that went on. Uh, the same thing happened a couple of other places uh, here in the New World. Charleston, in that regard, has a lot to do with, uh, uh, a lot to, is similar in a lot of ways to uh, Havana, Cuba, and Salvador, uh, Brazil. 
in the Bahia province of northeastern Brazil. All of these areas are river cities. They're all cradles of slavery. And all of them had European culture and African culture coming together. They were all cradles, and they all have fabulous musics that have come out of them. Uh, little distinctions among them. Uh, the Brazilian thing, for instance, a little different because there was more of a Native American influence in that part of the New World than in the other two. But essentially, they're the same. And they all have deep roots in West Africa, which came over with the enslaved Africans through these port cities. Uh, you could count New Orleans, um, but for my money, not as intense there, even though they're regarded as the birthplace of jazz because it was not as big a slave entry point as these other places that I've mentioned. It had lots of slaves and lots of uh, free Africans, lots of mulattoes, but that whole international thing that creates an art form like jazz just didn't exist there like it did here. Plus, this as, a t as an area, as a city, as a town, is older. So, that's the kind of thing that caused this music to evolve beginning in the late 19th, early 20th uh, centuries. It crystallized here in Charleston with the advent of the founding of the Jenkins Orphanage, uh, which was founded by Reverend Daniel Joseph Jenkins, a Baptist minister in 1891. Uh, the orphanage still exists. It was founded here downtown, and until the 1930s, when it moved, it uh, went up to North Charleston, where it still exists today. In fact, uh, no one has been able to find any ongoing orphanage older than the Jenkins in this country. One of the things that Reverend Jenkins did early uh, in that institution was to put in a music program. Uh, brass bands were very popular all over the country uh, after the Civil War and on into the late 19th century. Uh, every town had a community brass band, uh, many of which went out to some of the gazebos in the parks like we have here in Charleston and would play music for the community. And it was before the advent of the use of stringed instruments the saxophone uh, was very, very new at the time. So they were all mostly brass bands, which was a direct offshoot of the military bands, which is where the instruments for a lot of these bands came from. And it was the first provision of access to European musical instruments for Africans. So the military plays a big part in the evolution of American music particularly march music, which is the basis for all of American music here. And we had a lot of that here in Charleston. Uh, Reverend Jenkins founded that orphanage, and um, he was a very, very smart man, a uh, serious entrepreneur, uh, very, very successful. And uh, one of the reasons, it's apocryphal, I don't know that anybody has a direct quote, but one of the reasons it is said that he put in the music program is that respiratory diseases such as tuberculosis were a big problem, especially for poor people and people of color, everybody really, here in the Carolina Low Country at the end of the 19th century um, when he founded the orphanage, which began when he came across, uh, I think it was four uh, weaf children who had no food, no place to go, no families they could connect to, and he put them in a house he had on Upper Meeting Street, up near Mount Pleasant Street. That was the root of the Jenkins Orphanage. Uh, bedazzling as he was, and as convincing and persuasive as he was, in terms of dealing with people, especially uh, people in charge of things, he got access to the old Marine Hospital at 20 Franklin Street. John Paul knows about that building. And um, that was the first official site of the Jenkins Orphanage, uh, designed by Robert Mills, 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, very famous American architect from Charleston, and uh, quite a beautiful building. Uh, has been restored. Uh, I think the housing authority still operates out of there, so it's being used. And it's that pretty yellow stucco building just around the corner from the old Charleston jail off of Magazine Street. That was the original home of the Jenkins Orphanage. Uh, as an aside, uh, my friend Dan Morgenstern pointed out, he advises our Charleston Jazz Initiative. And we had a jazz picnic out at the Robert Mills Manor, the housing projects contiguous to uh, uh, the Marine Hospital building uh, a few summers ago. And we invited our national advisors in. Dan came in and he was astounded at that building. It said a lot about Charleston and it said a lot about the beginnings of our music and our culture and our contributions to American culture. Uh, as it turns out, orphanages played a big, big role in the development of young people uh, 19th, 20th centuries, really around the world. Somebody told me Vivaldi came out of an orphanage uh, in Europe. But we all know that Louis Armstrong, again, um, with New Orleans, uh, spent quite a bit of time in the colored waifs home there. And it's where he, uh, I think, got his first instrument, or at least played it after he was given it by some people he worked for. But Dan was amazed at the fact that uh, he certainly knew about the Jenkins Orphanage, but he'd never seen that building before. And to Charleston's credit, uh, what we deem to be important and what we preserve is that that building was there in the state that it's in uh, compared to Louis Armstrong's orphanage where there's only a part of the wall left. There's nothing else in the country like that building where the Jenkins Orphanage started. And um, so as I was saying, uh, he put in a music program because playing the brass instruments helped the cardiovascular system. It's tough to play a trumpet. It's tough to play a tuba. It's tough to play a trombone. And um, he knew that that would help their health he knew that you had to learn mathematics to play music. Uh, you had to be disciplined. You had to be focused. You had to have a work ethic. You had to learn how to take instruction from people. And so the music was almost a byproduct of all these other things that the playing of music would do for these children. He also employed there as the first teachers graduates and sometimes students of another traditional African-American institution here in Charleston that contributed mightily to jazz, which was the Avery Normal Institute. This was a school whose building also still exists in very, very fine form over at 25 Bull Street. It's a part of the College of Charleston system now. It's a research center. It was started shortly after the Civil War to educate uh, the freed uh, Africans. And um, it's interesting, again, in terms of Charleston, because here we had represented both sides of that dichotomy that had to do with what the intellectual thinking was that was necessary to advance the cause of the race. Uh, many of you are probably aware of the apparent conflict between the W.E.B. Du Bois type thinking on how to advance the cause of African Americans in the early 20th century and the Booker T. Washington theory of how to advance the cause of African Americans in the early 20th century. It was a big, big deal. Uh, Booker T. Washington was of the uh, thinking that the best thing the race could do was to help itself, pull itself up by its bootstraps, uh, further a kind of agricultural economy, which was prominent here in the South, and take care of themselves, and that way assimilate into the mainstream. W.E.B. Du Bois was of the thinking that formal education 
and assimilation into the mainstream was the way to go with the purpose in mind of creating what he called a talented tip, where the goal would be for 10% of the African Americans to become formally educated and lead the rest of the race. And this was important because you have to remember at that time, race was the central issue in the United States of America. We're talking late 19th, early 20th century. It's a big, big part of this American story. And I think fortunately, these days, we can talk about it way more openly and assess it for its importance than we have been up until now. But it's inescapable, and for the first 200 years of this country's history, it has been the defining issue. So here in this tiny little town on the coast uh, of the Atlantic Ocean here, uh, unlike a lot of other communities, we had both sides of this dichotomy represented, and it crystallized, frankly, uh, this is a bit oversimplified, but essentially it's true, crystallized in that music program up at the Jenkins Orphanage. Well, then, not up, over on Franklin Street. Uh, because what happened uh, at that time, keep in mind, jazz had not been invented yet. The term didn't actually come into usage until the 1920s in what came to be known as the jazz age. One of the difficulties in understanding the history of it is the semantic problems that go along with it. We had a form of music that, in my opinion, was at play before we even had the word. We name it jazz with hindsight. It used to be called things like ragtime, hot music, syncopated music, anything other than the traditional martial music that was the music of America at the time. The brass bands played the march music of John Philip Sousa and that type of thing. The ragtime music began to rag that music, syncopate the beat, uh, swing it, if you will, and make improvisations onto it. But again, that went on for at least 20 years before we had the word jazz. But so, with uh, the music instruction program at the Jenkins, uh, the young kids were taught uh, light classics, basically. Jazz was not taught at the Jenkins Orphanage. Because it's associated with that, we kind of assume that that's where the kids learned it. But it's this human element that they brought to the European music that they were taught, uh, and happened in a lot of other places, that caused what we know to be jazz to evolve. What I think distinguishes the Charleston musicians, again from New Orleans, and I really am not hating on them, but it's a good point of comparison because everybody knows about them and everybody knows what happened there. Uh, with Louis Armstrong uh, being a good example, our guys could read music, typically. Yes. All of them could. They were technically proficient and they could swing. The New Orleans guys, they could swing in their own way, but they couldn't read music. In fact, one of the reasons our guys ended up lesser known is because they were incorporated into the big bands of the swing era that came along after the jazz age, and the Fletcher Hendersons and the Duke Ellingtons and the Count Basies, uh, the Harry Jameses, later the Stan Kentons, employed them as section leaders. And if you know anything about a big band, those of you who've seen the Charleston Jazz Orchestra, you've literally seen some guys in certain sections counting off the rests and telling the other guys when to come in. The conductor can't do it all. It's too many people. And so guys from Charleston were particularly known for being these section leaders because they could read the music put in front of them, they had leadership skills, they could lead the rest of the players in the sections, and they were versatile. All the trumpet players could play the tuba, they could play the trombone, and that is true to this day. Again, as an example, some of you who've seen the Charleston Jazz Orchestra, which is led by a young man named Charlton Singleton, who's a coastal South Carolina native, he's from Arlanda, and he, among other things, many other things, is a multi-instrumentalist. 
And that's the musical tradition here in Charleston. There's a, a, a trumpet or a brass lineage that uh, we could take off going back to the early 20th century that goes from a man born in Pembroke, Georgia, who learned music at the Jenkins, named Clavis Smith, whose nickname was Jabber, who, by the way, was Louis Armstrong's only serious rival uh, in the early 20th century. Right on up through Cat Anderson, William Cat Anderson, who was also trained at Jenkins, who was a trumpet section leader for decades in the Duke Ellington Orchestra. If you ever heard or seen Ellington or, or heard the records, all the high note playing that the trumpet player was doing, uh, that was Cat, uh, right on up through, and in fact, if you extend it to South Carolina, and not just Charleston, uh, John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie from Chihuahua, South Carolina, and his innovations, just a couple of hundred miles up the road, uh, to a young man named Joey Morant, who lives and works in New York now, who, by the way, for the last several years, has played the national anthem on the trumpet to start the bridge run here uh, every year, uh, right on down to Charlton, who leads the uh, Charleston Jazz Orchestra. Uh, there's that brass lineage, like I said, that evolved out of here. And what our guys did was to influence the music in a lot of ways, uh, as nearly as we can tell, way more than from any other part of the country. Again, to distinguish it from New Orleans, New Orleans is known more for its distinctive sound that evolved more rapidly or more well known to people because the guys there tended to stay in New Orleans. Charleston guys left and went up to the Northeast, out to the Midwest, uh, overseas, all around the world and had great influences on this music. So I like to think that our contribution was just that. It was more of a contribution than it was a promotion of what we do here. Plus, New Orleans has been promoting itself for about 100 years now. And we started about five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but we're fixing that. And we're fixing it pretty fast. And believe you me, it's gaining traction. Um, for those of you who are from here, and or live here now, we're gaining quite a reputation around the world uh, for what happened here and what continues to happen. Uh, what we're very proud of is that the way we present the music today is to contextualize it in historical terms. Uh, when Charlton and I came together back in 2008 to form the orchestra, which at that time, the prototype, uh, was called the Charlton Singleton Orchestra, which really was a fantasy for about 10 years before we could do that. But it was only in 2008 that we could put the money, the opportunity, the access to enough musicians, Pat knows all this, uh, to get this thing done. And the very first show we did was called the South Carolina Hit Parade. And we only played tunes, jazz tunes, composed or made popular by players from Charleston and or other parts of South Carolina. And believe you me, there's a large enough body of work to put on something like that. And we did a two hour show with music from no place else other than the Palmetto State. And we incorporate it into everything that we do these days and it works. One of the things that makes what we're doing attractive now is that it's not only entertaining, it's authentic. And quite frankly, that seems to be fading in a lot of cultural and entertainment offerings, not just here in Charleston, but around the world. There's all the advantages of these new ways of doing things, but the old is getting lost, and the shoulders on which a lot of this stuff stands uh, is lesser and lesser known. And we think that's a mistake. So, as I was saying, we think the greatest contribution of the Charleston musicians, and I could go on and on and on with examples, is that they influenced the way this music uh, evolved. Uh, a good example is uh, a, a player from Aiken, South Carolina, by the name of John Bubber Miley, who's a trumpet player, 
played in the early Duke Ellington orchestras, who initiated the growling trumpet sound now that they all use, that Louis Armstrong used back then, that Charlton Singleton used with the plunger mutes that they put in front of the horn today. He introduced that in the 1920s in the Duke Ellington Orchestra. And when he left, he was replaced uh, for a short period of time by Clatis Smith, who was trained here in Charleston. Uh, and the way the music business in this country has gone is that a lot of the truth was disguised in terms of how things were put out commercially. One of Duke's uh, biggest evergreens, one of the biggest jazz standards in the American songbook is Mood Indigo. You've heard it. Bubba wrote that. Uh, never got a credit. Uh, wouldn't show up on any label, on any other records. And as Duke would do, he had the good sense to base his compositions on the skills of his players. Uh, I've looked over a ton of record labels, and um, at any given time, Again, using Duke as an example, fully a fifth to a fourth of his orchestra at any given time was composed of Charleston players. Uh, there's example after example after example of our influence. Uh, in 1917, when blacks were first allowed in the United States military, officially in World War I, there was a regimental band based out of the New York City, New Jersey area, called the 369th National Guard Unit that served under General Jack Pearson, who led the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. Another very interesting story and really expressive of the contradictions of American history. Uh, Jack Pearson was known as Black Jack Pearson because he led the uh, Mexican Wars and Indian Wars with the old Buffalo soldiers, the Negro soldiers. And that's who helped him win that war. When he ended up in charge of the forces in Europe in World War I, blacks weren't allowed in the military. So long story short, this 369th finally gets to serve, because the war started in 1914. And just like the story with the Tuskegee Airmen, in World War II, the people of color trained and trained and trained, but they never got to see combat. And because of these policies that we had, but uh, the Allies were losing the war. And so in 1917, the 369th finally got to go over, and still uh, they couldn't get to fight. Uh, the French were getting their butts kicked. All right, so they said, we'll take them. So the 369th, an American force, became affiliated with the French army. And this regiment had a band. It was a real regiment. I mean, they fought. They fired the machine guns and all the new stuff in uh, the Great War at the time. They won medals. In fact, that regiment was the most decorated regiment of Allied forces in France than any other. Uh, the English would not officially affiliate them, and the Americans wouldn't let them fight side by side. But the thing significant to what we're talking about here today is that that regimental band is the band that first introduced what we now call jazz music to Europe. That's an established historical fact. Uh, it was led by a gentleman by the name of James Reese Europe, who came out of another southeastern cradle of jazz, Mobile, Alabama, who by that time had moved to Washington, D.C., and oddly enough, again in this great American contradiction thing, lived pretty near where John Philip Sousa lived in Washington, D.C. But he was a, a, a real force in American popular music, because you have to remember at this time, 1910s, 1920s, things like uh, the whole social scene was changing. Public dancing, uh, women going out unescorted, all of that kind of thing was radical. It was brand new. We were just beginning 
to form this present day modern American culture. And by the way, uh, dance was very, very important. And three of the four major dance trends that were fundamental to American culture had their roots here in Charleston. The cakewalk, which is essentially an African-American kind of jig. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Ball in the Jack, uh, which was a huge dance, was created based on the tunes written by a Charleston minstrel by the name of Chris Smith, who wrote for Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, all these big guys who made their mark in the early jazz age. Then, of course, the Charleston. All right, which was written in terms of the music by a fellow from the Northeast named James P. Johnson, a fabulous stride piano player out of the tradition of Willie the Lion Smith and Fats Waller and later Duke Ellington and Polonius Monk and some of those guys. But where James P. got that 6 8 rhythm that which is a Charleston rhythm. His mother used to give rent parties in the San Juan Hill District of New York City, which was populated by people of color from Charleston, Savannah, Beaufort, coast Georgetown, coastal South Carolina, and it became all the rage. You also had members of the Jenkins Orphanage bands who by that time were going up to the Northeast who were known for performing on street corners, just like they did here in Charleston. And after playing the overtures and the light classics, they would end the show with, by ragging the music, playing what we now call jazz. And you've seen the pictures. There'd always be the little guy with the hat and the baton clowning around in front of the group, and then the adult chaperoning them, passing the hat for the contributions which is the part where Reverend Jenkins was particularly um, interested in. The bands made a ton of money uh, for the um, institution. And by that time, uh, Dugos Hayward and the Gershwins had hooked up, and they were beginning to stage Porgy, uh, and then Porgy and Bess, and a band from the Jenkins Orphanage actually went up and participated in the first production. So we had all this confluence going on. Um, I've come to find out that um, the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals uh, sent up consultants uh, when they were putting on that play um, to advise uh, with the language accents and low country culture and what have you in order to keep that play um, authentic. So all of this stuff was going on, uh, especially uptown in Manhattan, in Harlem, and the longshoremen and other people would show up at these rent parties, and they were everywhere, but uh, James Johnson's mother used to give them, and he was a kid, and he would be peeking around the corner from his room, watching these adults dance and have fun to these Charleston rhythms, and that's where the Charleston came from. So we're everywhere in terms of having created and contributed to uh, uh, jazz music here in America. Uh, and to finish the piece with the 369th uh, in France, and they later went over to uh, England uh, because they toured. And there's also the proverbial anecdote that uh, sounds fake because it's so funny, but it's actually true. Uh, when they landed um, in France, I forget the port, Cherbourg or one of them, they um, played the Marseille, and they played it straight for a couple of choruses, and then they ragged it, and they just tore it up. And there were apocryphal stories that people in attendance wanted to examine the instruments, because they've never heard anything like that before, and never heard music play like that. It's second nature to us, but it was radical at the time. But of the, uh, I think, 15, maybe 16 players in that regimental band, five, were from Charleston, all right, including uh, the sergeant major who was in charge of the music and who rehearsed the band, an Avery graduate by the name of Francis Eugene Michael, who was from a mulatto family, 
who, after Reconstruction here in Charleston, and after the disappointment of not having attained the social status that that class thought it would after the war, migrated to the Northeast, seeking better opportunities. Their deep Charleston roots in Brooklyn, New York, to this day, coming out of that migration from after Reconstruction here in town. But Francis uh, stayed, graduated from Avery, taught at the Jenkins, and led this band uh, for James Reese Europe uh, over there. And uh, there was a trombone player by the name of Herb Fleming, another trombone player by the name of Amos Gilliard, and there were two drummers, Herbert Wright and Stephen Wright, not related. Uh, and along with uh, Mr. Michael, all came out of this Jenkins experience, all came out of Charleston. And the contra contradictions continued. Uh, oddly enough, after they had made their mark and came back to the States, uh, they were, that regimental band at 369th was the centerpiece of the Armistice Day Parade in Manhattan. You've seen the archival footage of the black soldiers marching up Fifth Avenue, playing in the band with the little steel pan helmets and what have you. It's in all of the old films that deal with right after World War I. And um, as an homage, as a tribute to them, it's the only celebration parade in Manhattan, of which there were many, um, that went up Fifth Avenue instead of down Fifth Avenue. And the reason it went up Fifth Avenue was so that it would terminate in the neighborhood that that unit came from. It's absolutely true. And all based out of right here where you're sitting now. Um, again, with the contradictions uh, after they got home. Uh, by the way, uh, Reese Europe uh, was a major player. Uh, the other major dance craze was the Foxtrot, popularized by Vernon and Irene Castle, who were big time dancers in the early, in in the early 20th century. Their musical director was James Reese Europe, who really invented the Foxtrot. So these guys were hot by the time they got back from Europe after the war. And they were set to go on tour. And they had started the tour. They were in Boston, Massachusetts. And James Reese met his demise at the hand of Herbert Wright from Jenkins Orphanage in Charleston, who had become enraged after being disgruntled around thinking he had been treated unfairly with regard to his pay. And so the other side of the coin around all of our contributions is that one of our guys killed a guy who would have gone on to done even greater things with regard to American culture. So it just goes on and on and on and on. I think we're running out of time. I probably talked too long. But um, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be glad to, um, to entertain them. Yes. I knew this is far better. I'm a jazz musician and uh, played the county's band in front of the band. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Good. And I play on the trombone. Now I play the movie instruments, the euphonium and baritone horn. But I'm making a point, uh, as you mentioned, Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, with his innovation, when he first started playing the cornet or the trumpet, like you said, part of the field, he wasn't aware of the fact that it's required to put a mouthpiece on the board of the trumpet. <laughs> Mm. So he started playing the trumpet without the mouthpiece. <laughs> and that's how his range got so high, because if he could play, play on that small board, he was definitely capable of playing much higher register once he learned that a mouthpiece has to be attached to the trumpet. And this is where the orphanage came in and teaching him a lot about the techniques of the trumpet. So he picked up the trumpet without the mouthpiece and literally played it. He wasn't on time. Yeah. And so no one told him that he could not do it. He wasn't taught like our guys were taught. He was not taught. Like <laughs> yeah. See, so when he was taught later, he put on the mouthpiece and he said, well, I thought my Miss was sore. <laughs> <laughs> and he was able to project very nicely on, on the Well, thank you. That brings to mind, too, again, using the New Orleans comparison, um, and uh, with regard to uh, women in this whole scene, uh, there were girls in some of the Jenkins Orphanage bands. 
And Reverend Jenkins, when he found out that the bands could be lucrative with regard to revenue, put choirs on the road to do the same thing. that were mostly girls. But uh, since he mentioned uh, Lewis, it uh, also reminded me um, there was a blues shouter, jazz singer, a female out of Charleston in the 20s by the name of Bertha Hill. Bertha Chippy Hill. Very, very important, a contemporary of Ma Rainey's and Bessie Smith. And uh, when I found out about her, I later discovered that she had recorded with Lewis. And given my low self-esteem as a Charlestonian and general uh, used to being uh, uh, second fiddle, I simply assumed that she sang on his record. Because he was the giant. I mean, he was the father of modern jazz, Louis Armstrong. Yes. Well, lo and behold, and we have a recording in our archives now, a song called Trouble in Mind by Bertha Chippy Hill. Her nickname was Chippy. It was her record, and she was the headliner, and Louis was a side man. <laughs> yeah. So we were there. We're not known now because eras have changed. John Paul. Jack, um, you've been working at this for a long time. Where do you see, are you going to share with us some of the things that you could dream since we're only five years in this versus 100 years ago? Mm -hmm. You see Charleston going. Where, where are the things that we need to be doing? What, what are some of your goals for the next few years that you might see the community embrace? Okay, um, good question. Uh, I think we're on track, too, by the way. It's more than a fantasy or a wish. What needs to happen is that the performance of this music needs to be embraced more and more as it is. It needs to be regarded as fine art, as it now is. Uh, up until very, very recently, it's been generally considered to be low art, uh, jungle music, race music, that kind of thing. Uh, we now know that it's very, very high art. And one of the encouraging things is that the younger players, most of whom now come out of the academy, understand that it's very, very difficult to perform. It appears to be easy because the people who have been good at it make it look easy, just like a high-performing athlete. Uh, when you watch Hank Aaron play, it looks like anybody can play baseball. Not so. And it's the same thing with this music. And fortunately, I think, with the younger people coming along, there's a lot of genre bending. I was just in Savannah at its music festival, and one of the great classical bass players, Edgar Meyer, uh, was put together with Zakir Hussein, an East Indian tabla player, and Bela Fleck, a bluegrass and jazz banjo player, and they just killed it. And these are all young guys uh, except for Zakir, not people of color, who are improvising, who are doing all the things associated with jazz music, and just nailing it. So the future bodes well. So buy records, go to concerts, uh, speak proudly of where you live and where you're from, and I think we'll be just fine. Uh, on our end, on the performance end, we're going to continue to try to access the mainstream. We're going to try to get on stages. Uh, education is very, very important. One of the things the orchestra is going to do is tour, starting with the state, where we do high schools, maybe even middle schools, some of the colleges right here in South Carolina, uh, talk a little bit before and after shows and educate people. And so if you all could join us in that, we could take our rightful place at the American Culture Table. Yes. Um. Mr. Frazier, I just wanted to share the album with you. Uh, you talked about um, Americans being in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I had mentioned to you before that Arthur Briggs is my uncle. Mm -hmm. And that um, this is one of the albums that, and, and he was with the Jenkins Band, mm -hmm. by the way. Another and, very, I'm sorry, but another very important figure went over to Europe after the war and stayed between the wars. Mm -hmm. In fact, he's a good example of musicians from here becoming involved socially and politically. If I remember correctly, he was uh, imprisoned in France between the two wars for working with the resistance against the Germans. And he and several others from here had a whole lot to do with that hot club scene in Paris right after World War I with Ada Bricktop Smith and all that stuff um, in the Pagal and all of that. 
a lot of those roots are from the low country too. Yeah, yeah. Just Thank to you. Back and Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That very same scene. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Really? And they are connected to the House of Prayer. Okay. And I know they're somewhere in the vicinity here, but I think it'd be marvelous if we could get them up here. All right. I'm on it. <laughs> For those of you who couldn't hear, she was sharing having seen uh, a band of trombonists, about eight of them, yeah. in New Orleans who came down there from here and perform marvelously, and she suggested that we try to get them to perform here. So I told her we're, we're going to get that done. There was also, again, in the interest of not using New Orleans as a bad example, uh, all of these people knew about each other, and they all worked together. And again, as a researcher, I've had an opportunity to get into the specifics. But if you check some of the credits on a lot of the old records, the Jelly Roll Martin records, the Clarence Williams records, all of the real famous, important stuff out of New Orleans. At any given time, a third to a half of them were with mm -hmm. musicians from Charleston. So they all knew about each other. They all mixed in. Uh, but it's up to us now to sort the story out and give everybody their proper due. You're in yes. good place to listen to jazz. Live jazz? Live jazz? We find ourselves without a club right now, which happens, which is even happening in the big cities. Some of the old famous ones, um, the Jazz Showcase in Chicago, for instance, is gone. Although I understand they found a new location. Um, so most of the good live music here now is in restaurants. And it's very, very good. Uh, the Charleston Grill at Charleston Place has live music every night. And practically all of these places, there's no cover and no minimum. Uh, and a relaxed dress code. So there are no real inhibitors. To go on. It's there. Uh, Mercado has music every night. Uh, High Cotton has music every night. I would also direct you to our website, uh, jazzartistsofcharleston.org. I'll be glad to write it for you afterwards. And we have a calendar of where uh, local musicians are playing day to day. Yes. Unfortunately, it's gone. Yes, it didn't make it. It happens all the time. As popular as the music is right now, artistically, it's still very tough commercially. It always has been. In fact, a running joke in the uh, entertainment industry is, if you want to make a million dollars in jazz, spend two million. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, very, 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 it's always been a niche music, but that's slowly changing. It's getting more and more uh, into the mainstream. The clubs come and go, and quite frankly, even in the major markets, New York City, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, Miami, the only ones that are viable are ones that have stretched their uh, uh, definition of the music, and they offer other forms so they can stay in business. Are they on the building? Are they on the building? You go to Yoshi's in San Francisco, you're more likely to hear rock and roll than you are to hear jazz. The orchestra plays again on May 21st up at what we call the House of Swing, which is the Charleston Music Hall on John Street. And this time around, it'll be the music of Miles Davis. Oh, we missed that. We missed that. In this area, uh, Carolinian Library up in Columbia at the University of South Carolina which has all of Freddie Green's papers. I didn't have time to get into him. The great rhythm guitarist for the Count Basie Orchestra is a Charlestonian. And our archive is being processed at the Avery Research Center at the College of Charleston. Yes. Uh, maybe you hear that again about Miles Davis you just mentioned. Uh, someone was asking when the next orchestra performance was. Yeah. And I was saying it's May 21st. And the music being offered is the music of Miles Davis. Oh, right. Well, I see Caroline trying to get us going. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>